So we started with olfactory nerve, and I want to remind you that everything's good, okay? That it's purely sensory nerve that's responsible for the sense of smell, right? Okay, and it is one of the nerves that does not originate in the spinal cord, um, in the brain stem. It's actually fairly easy to remember. Think about this. Um, olfactory nerve goes to the right encephalon, okay, in the primary olfactory cortex, and the second cranial nerve that does not originate or does not synapse in the brain stem is the optic nerve. Okay, optic nerve, fibers of the optic nerve, which is also purely sensory and responsible for the sense of vision. It synapses, they synapse in hypothalamus, and second order neurons run from thalamus to the um, visual cortices in the occipital lobe. So it's I always, you know, I, I try to give you tips on how to remember things, and that gives you an idea. I'm not going to ask you, you know, extensively, like, where exactly in the thalamus optic nerves synapse with the second order neurons. But you have to understand that two nerves, two, do not synapse, do not start, do not go into the brainstem, optic and olfactory. Does it make sense? Those two, so olfactory goes into the olfactory cortex, optic goes into the thalamus. Are we clear? Awesome. Awesome. Huh? Into the thalamus, yes. So this, this will be thalamus, okay? shown here, lateral genuculate nucleus of the thalamus. Don't worry, you don't have to know the nucleus, no, okay? You have to understand that these two are not in the brainstem. We're good? And then um, you have to know what is the difference between the nerve, optic nerve, and optic tract, okay? You've got optic nerve that extends from the retina of the eye to the optic chiasma and then you've got optic tract that extends from optic chiasma to the thalamus. Okay, so each optic tract combines fibers from both optic nerves. Can you see that? Can you see that on the picture? You have maroon fibers, as I mentioned last week, that go to the right hemisphere, and you have blue fibers that go to the left hemisphere. Does that make sense? Can you see that? Okay, we can move on, right? So now we start to talk about nerves that actually originate in the brain stem in the first or third number. Kilomotor, we talked about it. Oculomotor nerves responsible for eye movements. You can guess it from the name. Okay, so not only this, so eye movements. Eye movements, are they conscious? Do you move your eyes? Can you control your eye movements? Yes. Is that somatic activity then or autonomic? Somatic, right. So somatic fibers. Can you voluntarily dilate and, cons or, well, in this case, not dilate. Can you voluntarily constrict your pupil? Volunt no, you cannot voluntarily constrict the pupil. So that involuntary, subconscious activity, is that somatic or autonomic? Autonomic, so you're going to have autonomic fibers. Okay? Does that make sense? Now this guy starts from the midbrain. Again, it makes a lot of sense. Which two reflexes midbrain controls? Do you remember? Two reflexes.
I'm showing you two reflexes. That's one. Following the moving object, right? It makes sense that midbrain controls your eyes, right? Um, dysfunction, lazy eye. Usually it's the uh, external strabismus, which means if the muscle, the, the lateral rectus, is more powerful than the medial rectus, it will pull the eye to the left. And here, two nerves, two more, and you can notice that they are not in the proper order. Okay, so nerve number four is trochlear. It controls the superior oblique muscle right here. And superior oblique muscle pulls the eye outward and downward. Okay, so kind of you're looking at your shoulder, that's superior oblique. Okay, if it's paralyzed, you not only won't be able to do so, your eye will get pulled medially. Does that make sense? This way. Again, lazy eye. It originates in the midbrain as well. Okay, and it controls the eye movements. It works together with oculomotor nerve. Does that make sense? And nerve number six, you can see I skipped five for now. Okay, nerve number six is abducens nerve. Abducens originates in the pons and it innervates lateral rectus muscle. Lateral rectus muscle, which is straight muscle attached to the lateral aspect of the eyeball, pulls the eye to the, to the outside. So if the nerve is dysfunctional, if the nerve is paralyzed, then the eyeball will be moved medially. Does that make sense? Can you see that? Can you understand that? Let me say it again. You have an eyeball, right? You have lateral muscle that pulls it outside. If the nerve is paralyzed, nothing pulls the eye outside. The muscle that pulls it inside will cause this. Okay? This. The eye will turn inside. This is called internal strabismus. Does that make sense? Uh, then it won't move left or right. Yeah, someone can have both, yes. Of course. I mean, it's not frequent, but it can happen. Think about this. You have muscle for, like, simplicity. Think about your eye, and it can go in four directions. It can go up, down, outside, and inside. Do you follow me? All these muscles that control your eye movement, they sort of balance each other. They play thug of war. Does that make sense? Now, if the muscle that pulls the eye inside is paralyzed, it cannot compensate for the pulling effort outside, and the eye looks outside. Does that make sense? If the muscle that moves I outside is paralyzed, then it's going to be completely opposite. Do you see that? Any questions? Can we move on? We can? Okay. Here is trigeminal nerve. It's a huge nerve. Okay. The largest. Largest cranial nerve. Okay, it starts in the pons, and it's main sensory nerve of the face. It is responsible for the transmission of sensations for touch, for temperature, for pain, general somatic sensations from the face. Okay? It has three divisions. Ophthalmic, which would 
bring the sensations from which part of the face? Of Talmic, what do you think? Of Talmic. Around the eyes, yes. Okay. Including, for instance, things like eyelid, okay? Cornea. Nasal cavity. If somebody touches your cornea, something touches your cornea. Where's cornea, by the way? Cornea. Anybody knows where cornea is? It's eyeball, yeah, anterior portion of the eyeball. If, some, if you touch the anterior aspect of the eyeball, what are you going to do? You're going to blink. That's a reflex, right? Because you have sensory, you have uh, the afferent endings in your cornea. You touch it, you blink. Okay? Then you have maxillary division. So those are sensory inputs from maxilla, right here. Upper jaw. Does that make sense? Teeth, skin, upper lip, nasal cavity. Again, if something touches your the mucosa of the nasal cavity, what are you going to do? No, something like gets into your nose, something like, yeah, you're going to sneeze, right? And finally, mandibular division. Now, this is interesting. So, mandibular division has two functions. The sensory or afferent function, teeth, tongue, skin of the chin. You have to understand, though, that sensory input from the tongue that's transmitted through the trigeminal nerve, it is not taste. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because with your tongue, you not only feel taste, you also have a classic like pressure sensation. Does that make sense? That, okay, good. Because, I mean, something without taste, you still know that you, you, you're touching it with your tongue, right? So, we've got olfactory, maxillary, and mandibular branches that are afferent. Trigeminal nerve also has motor efferent function. It controls muscles of mastication. What is mastication? Chewing, yes. So you can test the function of each branch of trigeminal nerve um, separately. Think about this. If you suspect that the patient has a damage to the ophthalmic division, all you need to do is to touch um, the cornea. If the patient blinks, it's fine. If the patient doesn't blink, then the afferent branch is damaged. Right? If you want to test the functionality of the maxillary, anything like pin, safety pin, or something hot, something cold, touch the skin around the upper lip, for instance, and check for the functionality. And with mandibular branch, it's even easier. Because all you have to do is to ask a patient to chew. If the patient cannot properly chew, the patient cannot properly control the muscles for mastication, which include masseter, buccinator, temporalis, muscles that move the lower jaw, okay? Then you know that it's a damage to the mandibular branch. Does that make sense? I'm going to ask you about the clinical testing. It's common sense, so you have to, but you have to be able to make this connection, okay? I give you, for instance, several examples, and you tell me which one will work for trigeminal, all right? Does that make sense? The common condition associated with the trigeminal nerve is called tic doloreux, which is French, or in the human language, trigeminal neuralgia. It's probably the most excruciating pain known to humans. Okay? Usually it comes from the inflammation of the nerve or sometimes the blood vessel, if it loops and presses on the trigeminal nerve, it can cause the pain sensation as well. 
What sucks about trigeminal neuralgia is that it is sort of unpredictable. Okay, it can come and go, but it, when it comes, you, you're going to scream. Okay, does that make sense? It can get fixed. If it's a blood vessel, it's a little surgery, okay? If it is an inflammation, it can be treated with corticosteroids. However, sometimes you cannot pinpoint the exact place where trigeminal nerve is dysfunctional. And in this case, people have to get this nerve resected. You just cut it. Does that make sense? Huh? Well, they try to cut uh, the sensory, the afferent branches, okay? You lose the sensation on a certain part of the face. No, 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 no. Well, numb, yes. So you don't feel. You still can control, you just don't feel. Does that make sense? Um, sort of a temporary paralysis of trigeminal nerve happens when you receive the anesthesia, dental anesthesia. Essentially, when, for instance, your upper teeth are being removed, then anesthesia is aimed at the maxillary branch. If teeth of the lower jaw are being removed, then anesthesia aims at the mandibular branch. Yes? It's very pinpointed. It's local. It, it's localized, yes. It depends on where it is. I mean, since it's three branches, it can be in, it's if ophthalmic, it's going to be up. If it's maxillary, it's going to be lower. If it's mandibular, it's going to be even lower. Um, I, I can tell you that, a, a friend, I mean, I, you had it, how is that? So again? Okay, well. Now, a friend of mine had um, trigeminal neuralgia right before a camping trip. And he said that he just, he just went to emergency because he couldn't tolerate it. It was, it was excruciating pain. Luckily, I never had it. Oh, yeah. So you can see here the ophthalmic branch, okay, the maxillary branch, and what's, you know, what I wanted to pinpoint sort of here, I, the picture, I don't know, it's, it's quite lousy, but can you see that, the one that uh, with the blue arrow? Those are nerve endings that go to the, uh, the roots of the teeth. So when you get numbed in the uh, dental office, that's what they numb, and those are the afferent branches, they go to the roots of the teeth and lower jaw. And these are branches that innervate um, chewing muscles. Okay, temporalis, masseter, pterygoids, okay, responsible for moving your lower jaw. Question? Got it? Oh, yeah, yeah, if, and think about this, that's actually a good point. Um, sometimes people have severe, um, don't take care of the teeth, and there's an inflammation in the roots, and it forms a cyst, and say it's bacterial infection in a cyst, and, you know, it's swelling. In many cases, you know, you have, you must go to the dental office. It's an emergency situation, because essentially, these branches provide a direct uh, pathway to the brainstem. So you may end up with meningitis or encephalitis, bacterial meningitis or bacterial encephalitis, which is, trust me, not something that you want for yourself. Okay? 
facial nerves. Now, it's sort of, you know, you can think about some nerves in pairs, all right? So facial nerve is the motor nerve of the face, okay? Also comes from pons. So that it's mostly motor, okay? It says mixed, it's mostly motor. Five major branches that somewhat match uh, names of the muscles in the face, temporal, zygomatic, buccal, mandibular, and cervical. I'm going to see them. We'll look at the picture. Now, main function of those branches, control your facial expressions. Okay? All your facial expressions are because of the facial nerve. Okay? Autonomic controls to the secretory glands on your face, which includes lacrimal glands. What do they produce? Lacrimal tears. Nasal glands, which produce just nasal discharge. And submandibular and sublingual glands that produce saliva. Does that make sense? So those two are motor functions, whether they are somatic, skeletal muscles of the face, or autonomic. Does that make sense? Um, sensory function. Taste buds of the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Okay? Not the entire tongue, but anterior two-thirds, that sensory inputs the taste. Um, how can you test function for functionality? I mean, you can ask the person to play Jim Carrey, but you can also check, um, well, you can think about different parts. So if there is an autonomic dysfunction, give the, you know, give the person a, a piece of onion and see if the person is going to cry. Lacrimal gland control. Um, ask person to make facial expressions and see if it's normal. Um, assess the taste. So at the tip of the tongue, some strong taste in um, sugar, vinegar, you know, lemon juice. See if person can distinguish taste. Does that make sense? A common disease, well, condition associated with the facial nerve is Bell's palsy, which is a paralysis of the facial nerve. It is, you know, remember we talked about cranial nerves, how they are paired, right? It is rare that any nerve is affected on both sides. Usually if it's a nerve problem, it's on one side. But the, the thing is, in Bell's palsy, it's either nerve inflammation or virus infection, specifically with herpes virus that causes the nerve inflammation and paralysis. And the patient's face becomes paralyzed. Um, probably the most prominent condition is the um, lowering of the corner of the mouth in the affected side. Also, lack of control of the lacrimal gland. Sometimes it's just constant tear dropping. Sometimes it's lack of tears. Okay. Again, I observed it. One of my friends. It happened pretty much overnight. And... They moved away, and I saw him in three years after the condition started. He still had it. Huh? I mean, it doesn't... So people generally, uh, the people recover, okay? But completely recover, not all of them completely recover. 
So he didn't recover completely. He still had some residual symptoms. And there is no like very specific treatment. It's just corticosteroids to reduce inflammation of the nerve. Make sense? Okay. Now this is representation with all the branches. So you can see temporal branch. That innervates the temporal sides of the head. The temporalis muscle right here. The zygomatic branch, which you can say innervates the zygomaticus muscles. The buccal branch, the buccinator muscle, mandibular branch, innervates mandible and cervical branch, innervates platysma. Does that make sense? Okay. Vestibular cochlear nerve. Vestibular means balance. Cochlear means hearing. This nerve originates in the cochlea and vestibule of the inner ear. Okay. Enters the brain stem, the border between the pons and medulla. It pretty much has two branches. One branch is vestibular, which is responsible for balance. Another branch is cochlear, which is responsible for hearing. The main function, you may say, not exclusive, I wouldn't say exclusive, but the main function, of course, is sensory. Sensation of balance, sensation of hearing. Does that make sense? Okay, how can you check the dysfunction the person hears or not, right? However, well, we didn't talk about this special sense yet, hearing, but what else can impair somebody's hearing? Do you know, maybe just know that. Uh -huh. Eardrum. If eardrum is ruptured, that's that's it. Okay, does that make sense? So you have to make sure that um, conduction pathway for sound is intact. You know, nothing is wrong with eardrum or auditory ossicles that sound can be normally transmitted to the cochlea. And then if it can, then it's probably a nerve. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, any sort of damage to the nerve, vestibular cochlear nerve, will impair either the hearing portion or the balance portion. The hearing portion means that the person will develop central or neurosensory deafness or nerve deafness okay um, it can be treated with cochlear implants if the damage to the vestibular portion that's really lousy condition because the patient becomes um, nauseated starts to vomit often so pretty much person experiences non-stop motion sickness hmm? vertigo vertigo is probably going to be the least of the problems because then as the consequence imagine that you live in a constant you constantly feel out of balance physically out of balance you cannot maintain the balance properly like you constantly have like seasickness even when you're sitting which is pretty bad honestly does that make sense? Glossopharyngeal. You look at the name and you say, okay, glosso, vocal cords, okay, larynx, pharyngeal, throat. Mixed nerves, okay, you have both sensory and motor functions. They um, get to the medulla, okay, upper part of the medulla. 
So the motor fibers control swallowing and it's somatic fibers. Does that make sense? Autonomic motor fibers and glossopharyngeal nerve parotid salivary glands. You can see the parotid salivary gland right here. You can see that it's quite large. Interestingly enough, parotid salivary gland is responsible only for about a quarter of your salivary secretion, despite of its size. Sensory. Taste from the posterior tongue and pharynx. Does that make sense? Now, let's stop for a second and discuss. This is not going to be on the test, but I just want to give you sort of a connection. What is the motor, somatic motor function of this nerve? Look at this. Swallowing. How do you swallow? What do you do? You have food in your mouth. What do you do? Your tongue, well, it's not necessarily speed, but whatever you have in the mouth, whatever you are about to swallow, pushes the content of your mouth back, right, into your throat. And then glossopharyngeal nerve conveys the sensory input of something in your throat to the medulla. Does that make sense? Medulla in response stimulates pharyngeal muscles again to contract and push the food down your throat. Does that make sense? Because think about this. When you initiate the swallowing, it's voluntary. When it keeps going, it is not. You cannot just stop it in your pharynx and say, nope, it's not going anywhere. I decide to stop my foot right in my throat and it's going to stay there forever. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's, it's called a swallowing reflex. You start with voluntary pushing the um, food into your throat. Then you have sensations of food in the throat, glossopharyngeal nerve. Then stimulation of pharyngeal muscles, swallowing. Another important function of glossopharyngeal nerve the control of levels of oxygen and CO2 in your blood in the carotid sinuses and control the blood pressure. Now let me ask you something. Imagine that your the concentration of carbon dioxide in your blood goes up. Do follow me. It goes up. The Receptors, chemoreceptors, in the carotid sinuses, right here, they sense that CO2 concentration in your blood is going up. And they send this information to the medulla. What's going to be the response to elevated CO2 concentration in the blood? Huh? Why? Why? Why are you going to breathe deeper and faster? Not so much first, but second. Jack is right. You, you need to get rid of CO2. And you can get rid of CO2 by breathing harder and faster. Does that make sense? Say again? Great point that you brought it up. You hype so getting into the respiratory physiology, but let's let's just make sure that we understand. Hyperventilating is when your respiration doesn't match your needs. Like you're sitting now, are you working out? Now. No. So if you start to breathe hard, that's hyperventilating. Now imagine that you run 40 yard dash. Are you breathing hard? 
yeah, you're probably breathing hard when you run like hell, right? But at the same time, that's what that's what is needed. You need that oxygen supply. You need to get rid of all that CO2. So it's not hyperventilating. It's a normal ventilation for that activity. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, yeah. It's it 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 is an increase in the rate and the depth of breathing, but we shouldn't use hyper because it matches your activity. Do I make sense? Good. So that's number one. Number two, battery receptors in the same carotid sinuses. They monitor blood pressure. Okay. Blood pressure goes up, signal goes to the medulla oblongata, medulla will decrease the heart rate and dilate blood vessels. So blood pressure drops. Does that make sense? Now, it gives you an idea where glossopharyngeal nerve goes. Which part of the brain controls visceral functions? Which part of the brain stem, I'm sorry, controls visceral functions like respiration and cardiovascular activities? Medulla. Since it conveys signals from chemoreceptors and baroreceptors, where should those signals go? To the medulla. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Now, <clears throat> obviously, you cannot possibly test <laughs> baroreceptor reflex. No, seriously. I mean, you can, but it's going to be a little inhumane. Okay? What you can do is you can check the swelling. Okay, when a person tries to swallow the position of the uvula, it closes uh, nasopharyngeal cavity when you swallow. And you can check gag and swallowing reflexes. Go ahead. Yeah? Perhaps, yeah. Yeah, that, oh, you mean what they act on? Yeah, this nerve. Glossopharyngeal, yeah. They numb the... Um, proprioceptors in the pharynx, so gag reflex is not getting activated. Say it again. I, I don't, I don't, I mean, when you stick like fingers down your throat, I probably you just don't stick them deep enough. <laughs> Mm. I've never seen, I mean, I, all people that I drank with, they gag reflex works pretty well. Of course, another testing that you can check the, the glossopharyngeal nerve with, a little bit of a tastant, something bitter, on the posterior third of the tongue. That's taste, right? The person can feel and fine. Vagus. Cranial nerve 10. Um, from the medulla. It goes out of the cranium and enters the body cavity. And it controls mm, practically everything. Okay. Seriously. Vagus nerve transmits major controlling signals, autonomic signals, autonomic signals to um, all, practically all visceral organs, okay? So we talk about heart, lungs, stomach, kidney, pancreas, spleen, um, and upper part of the intestines. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's going to be autonomic function. Do you follow me? So vagus nerve controls the internal organs. It sends autonomic motor controls and receives visceral afferent impulses, visceral sensations. Does that make sense? That's vagus nerve. Um, skeletal muscles of pharynx and larynx. That's somatic controls. Now, if you think about it, again, 
vagus nerve will be responsible for swallowing along with glossopharyngeal and it is also responsible in the control of your vocal cords damage to the vagus nerve will alter the sound of your voice so maybe it will deprive you of you know speaking at all does that make sense okay now, what can happen if vagus nerve is damaged? Obvious thing, um, impaired swallowing reflex, number one, and change in a voice sound. A little less obvious, impaired visceral controls. Vagectomy, the transaction of the vagus nerve, may lead to things like elevated heart rate or constipation. Does that make sense? Because vagus nerve, it's kind of, we have to make those connections. Vagus nerve is the part of parasympathetic nervous system. Can anyone remember what is the function of parasympathetic nervous system? What kind of care? stimulates, uh, makes it work harder or slows it down? Body is at rest. Good. So parasympathetic system equals body at rest. When your body is at rest, what happens to your heart rate? It slows down. So parasympathetic system slows your heart down. Does that make sense? What happens to your digestive activities when you are at rest? They accelerate. That's when you digest. Okay? Your heart slows down, your intestines start to work. Does that make sense? You cut the vagus nerve. What's going to happen to the heart? The heart rate is going to elevate. Because it used to be kept down, but now it isn't. Does that make sense? What's going to happen to digestive activities? They're going to slow down because vagus nerve used to keep them active and now it's not there. It doesn't transmit um, autonomic motor output. Digestive system is slowing down, which means constipation. Question? To where? Okay. Well, that, that would probably be explained by a different reason when somebody poops. The person essentially performs so-called Valsalva's maneuver. In Valsalva's maneuver, when you do any sort of really hard work, either pooping through constipation or trying to lift very heavy load, what you do, and by the way, I mean, if you want, we can talk. Next time somebody takes a crap, try to speak through that. It's really hard. Or when you do the deadlift, really heavy deadlift, try to speak through that. You're going to drop the barbell. Reason for that, when you make this hard effort, either pooping or lifting, you close your vocal cords and sort of it's sort of a reflectory activity your lungs will try to push the air through the vocal cords but they won't be able to because they're going to be closed essentially it leads to inflation of the lungs and stabilization of the trunk it increases the pressure in the thoracic and abdominal cavities does that make sense when you lift increased pressure in the abdominal cavity stabilizes your core when you poop Increased pressure in the abdominal cavity pushes the feces out of the rectum. Now, that increased pressure in the abdominal cavity projects to the increased blood pressure. In order to push 
um, blood through the blood vessels, heart rate has to go up. Does that make sense? Your pump has to go faster to keep pushing blood through the elevated resistance. Does that make sense? So that's, that's probably why they have that temporary spike in the heart rate. And they have no other symptoms? During the poop. And they just keep, keep beating. Even after everything, like the defecation is finished. Maybe it's a vagal dysfunction. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe vagal dysfunction then. Yeah. If it keeps, if it keeps racing. So essentially you test this mostly by the gag reflex, okay? Like glossopharyngeal, okay? So you usually test glossopharyngeal and vagus together. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask about this condition and tell you on Tuesday, okay? Now accessory nerves, nerve number 11. Um, there are still debates in the field of anatomy whether these nerves should be considered cranial or spinal because these accessory nerves originate not in the brain stem but in the spinal cord so they do not originate in the cranium however they enter the cranium through the frame and magnum okay and they leave through the jugular frames these are mixed nerves <clears throat> primary motor activity is to control muscles of the neck and shoulders, um, sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscles. Sternocleidomastoid muscles responsible for turning your head left and right and trapezius muscles are responsible for shrugging your shoulders. Clinical testing for accessory nerves would be to check the strength of sternocleidomastoid right and the ability of a person to elevate the shoulders for instance damaged side on the damaged side person won't be able to elevate the shoulder does that make sense <coughs> number 12 the last cranial nerve is hypoglossal nerve um, under the tongue hypoglossal mainly motor well kind of almost exclusively motor it controls the muscles of the tongue and essentially responsible for mastication Does that make sense tongue is the giant muscle actually the strongest muscle in your body Relative to its size, you have to understand, okay. Relative to its size, your tongue is the strongest muscle in your body and clinical testing, if the person can show you the tongue, just do this. The person can protrude tongue, then the nerve is functional. Dysfunction to a certain side, say dysfunction to the left side or paralysis of the left side, will lead to the tongue deviating towards the affected side okay so if left side is affected the tongue will move to the left side if right side is affected the tongue will point to the right side does it make sense so for nerves we're going to do the i'm going to give you about 20 25 minutes for the paper chase i'm going to pause it